right, so this is my topic. You've been staring at it for like 10 minutes now, so we'll move on. I'm just going to give you a brief overview of what I'm going to be talking about tonight, today. Um, and I'll say at the outset that Sayed, Sayedna said most of what I'm going to say. In fact, he said it better. So um, I'm just going to just kind of roll through um, a lot of this, hopefully, and be able to concentrate on the, on the things that are unique. Um, I'm going to try to convince you, as Sayedna talked to us about, that um, silent science is uh, heavily influenced by its paradigm, or Sayedna called it worldview. It's the same thing. Um, and that that worldview is naturalism. He called it materialism, same thing. Um, this influence leads to forced naturalistic explanations of data, some of which does do fit, um, and some of which not so nicely um, fit with naturalistic interpretations. And I'm going to give you three examples um, among many examples of this. Um, I'll show you that we're never going to be able to prove creation or, thankfully, disprove it. No one can do that. Um, and then we'll move on to the truth of scripture. Um, as Sayedna, again, alluded to, uh, scripture is truth, but it's not always scientific. Uh, God and faith are, by definition, beyond science. Um, again, as Sayedna said, these are two different spheres. Um, up, but so there are lots of scientific questions, lots that have to do with, um, that intersect with our lives, but one big one is how were we created? Um, is Genesis historical? How do we reconcile the Bible account, which seems to contradict uh, the scientific information on the age and formation of the universe and with the theory of evolution? Of course, we'll be focusing on the latter. So was it like this? Um, God made man. Uh, was it like this? Or, and we've heard allusions to this, was it something where God set some process in motion somewhere along the way? Or none of the above, or all of the above? Or... Um, so first, let's start with this idea that there is conflict here between scripture and science. Um, it's understandable why, why people think there is, but uh, we're all here to tell you that, and to hopefully convince you that there isn't um, a conflict between these things. Science is about the observable world, whereas scripture is about the non-observable world. Science is about discovery. Scripture is about revelation. Omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence are physically, biologically, cosmically impossible, right? But they are how we describe God. So therefore, God is automatically outside of the scope of science. If I could explain God to you scientifically, if I could prove him, his existence, then he wouldn't be much of a God at all, and we'd have no reason to believe in that kind of a being, right? He has to be outside of science, by definition. So this question about who made God, that's a scientific kind of question, and we can't ask that about God. So one can engage in science, and not everyone thinks this. Well, actually, the first part, yes, one can engage in science without believing in God, but one does not have to abandon God to engage in science, and that's kind of been our thesis throughout here is that these are not mutually exclusive things. They're not anathema to each other. Belief is a matter of faith. You shouldn't be brought out of faith because of science. Creation is a miracle, right? It has to be. Something out of nothing is impossible. So we can talk about, um, about evidence for creation, but at some point, there'll be a limit to what science can discover about it, right? At some point, science has to hit a wall because something miraculous happened there. To some extent, though, we can scientifically describe God's handiwork, and that's what um, one of the joys of we as, you know, of us as scientists is we get to do that. All right, so 
Science has a paradigm, has a worldview. Um, this is an illustration of an elephant being touched by many, many blind people, and every single one has a different interpretation of what this thing is. Um, this is kind of a lame way of illustrating that worldview is the lens through which you see something. So um, you can be observing, two people can be observing the exact same phenomenon and have two completely different interpretations of what it is, and that sort of thing, that sort of the interpretation is heavily influenced by worldview, by paradigm. Um, even though science is not a person, science definitely has a paradigm. Uh, this was from um, one of the evolution trials that occurred um, a few years ago. The judge, um, as a result of some expert testimony, said this, science has been limited to the search for natural causes to explain natural phenomena. Methodological naturalism is thus a paradigm of science. It's a ground rule that requires scientists to seek explanations in the world around us based upon what we can observe, test, replicate, and verify. So that's science's job. This worldview didn't always exist, by the way. Um, the world's leading scientists used to be theologians. Their worldview was very different than this. Uh, descriptions of the natural world necessarily included God, almost to a fault, actually, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But this is definitely science's current paradigm. It's what Sayedna called materialistic. We call it naturalistic, methodological naturalism. Everything has to have a naturalistic explanation or else it isn't. That's it. So, what are some questions that can't be answered this way? Can't be observed, tested, verified, replicated? You know, do we have spirits? Are angels real? Did Lazarus, was Lazarus risen from the dead? Impossible to answer these questions scientifically. And so, instead of the enterprise of science just saying, well, we can't say anything about those things, that would be fine. That would be appropriate. Instead, science says, you're crazy. That's not real. And that's a problem, right? Just because you can't answer questions in your way, does that mean they can't be real questions? These are meaningless things? Obviously, we don't believe that's the case. Unfortunately, though, paradigm triumphs over truth again and again. So this is a cartoon. It's actually pretty famous. Um, making fun of creationists, right? It says, I think we should, it says, um, it's a bunch of math equations, and then it says, uh, this here is, do I have, can you see the cursor? No. All right, I'll try to use the pointer. Is this the pointer? It won't reach, will it? Nope. All right. So it's a bunch of equations, and then it says, uh, then a miracle occurs, and then a bunch of other equations, right? So, and then the one scientist saying, I think you should be more explicit here in step two. So they're making fun of us. That's cool. We can take it. Um, but my thesis here, or among my thesis at this part, at this point anyway, is that they're doing the same thing, right? So there's the Big Bang, natural selection, random mutation, and then what you get is life on Earth emerged from non-life between 4.4 million years ago. Um, and what you've heard a couple of times already today is that also requires faith because all the evidence suggests that's just not true. The paradigm of science, though, dictates that that has to be true, right? Because nothing that must include something supernatural can be. So they're limited. And that's the only problem. So. Um, as I alluded to, uh, naturalism, which is what exists now, which is the paradigm of science now, wasn't always, right? So um, Sayedna also alluded to this. I'm basically just giving his talk, but worse. Um, I'm glad you're all here. So um, what he alluded to is the fact that um, there was a time when the Bible was, the, the truth of the Bible had to um, be verified in order for something to be scientifically true. So this is where the idea of geocentricity 
why it was so popular and why it lasted so long. That is, that the Earth was the center of the solar system, right? Or of the universe, actually. This was an idea posited by Aristotle in 300 BC. And in the Middle Ages, Thomas Aquinas, who was the founder of scholasticism, and many others like him, were like, oh, fantastic. Yes, because there are all these Bible verses that seem to indicate that we are the center of the universe. Um, and that the sun goes around the earth. So Aristotle, who's this heathen, Greek, pagan, terrible person, is actually proving scripture. And every scientific discovery is tested against scripture. And if it fails, then it isn't real. That's a problem. Because the Bible is not a science book, right? As Sayedna alluded to. Um, and this is why when Galileo came around and was like, ah, uh, doesn't seem to be working that way, they're like, nope, you're wrong. All the evidence was staring them in the face that this earth was not the center of the universe, and it took much longer than it should have because of paradigm, because scripture was interpreted in such a way that the earth could not be not the center. Sticking to paradigm, prevents us from being able to say, I know this, but I could be wrong. And we can't ever let go of that. We always have to say that. Any scientist worth his or her salt knows that. You have to be able to say, this is what I can tell you about the functioning of the heart, or about the brain, or about the cosmos. But I could be wrong. And the problem with paradigm, the problem with this naturalism, is that um, anything other than the theory of evolution um, is judged to be wrong, despite the evidence against it. And that's a problem. So now I'm going to move on to my three examples of where the data don't seem to fit this naturalistic explanation at all, and where I would say under any normal circumstance a scientist would based on improbability alone, we had a great talk on, on probability today, uh, they would discard this interpretation no problem, except they can't. They can't because there's nothing other than the theory of evolution. There's nothing they can add to it that would have to include a god. They can't do that. So then they come up with hokey things to try and... All right, so this is a model, obviously, of a bacterial flagellum. So this tiny green thing is uh, a bacterium, and it's got several little tails, projections, that are called flagella, and they propel the bacterium. And it's a simple organism, among the simplest of organisms. And that's what the one flagellum looks like. That's a model of it. It's crazy complicated, all right? Each of these colorful things is a protein, and each of those is encoded by a gene. But to make this flagellum, um, you don't just need all of these genes to be made and to work together like this. You need them to, happen, to be expressed in a certain order, or else the whole thing fails. So the theory of evolution, um, standing alone, states that each of these proteins evolved over time. That each one of them started in some state, and then through random mutation, uh, some were considered fit, more fit than others, and those were passed on, selected for, and then those were the ones that survived. That's all fine and good, and that is very powerful. Random mutation and natural selection is a very, very powerful tool, and it explains a lot of what we have going on right now. It really does. But it has limitations, um, as both Abuna alluded to and Kevin alluded to, with information, with probability. There's some things it just cannot do. Um, and the flagellum really is one of them. So there are tens of proteins involved in its formations. But first, one part has to form, and then another, and then another. So what happens is that the genes that encode for the different groups of proteins are encoded in order. So there are then separate sections of DNA not associated with the proteins themselves 
that control when those genes are turned on. Those, uh, there's like three waves to make this flagellum. So the first wave of genes is transcribed and it accounts for most of the first part of the machinery. One of the genes that's transcribed in that first wave turns on the second set of genes. One of the genes in the second set, one of the proteins encoded, turns on the third set of genes. That's super cool, and a naturalistic explanation would say, well, wow, I mean, evolution just did that. No, that's, that's not possible. Is it possible for a malarial organism to develop resistance through random mutation and natural selection to, uh, you know, DDT? Absolutely. It has happened. Random mutation and natural selection can do that. It can do a lot. It can't do this. Why? Because the control genes have no selective pressure on them. They can't be selected for. They would have to rot mutate randomly and somehow Luckily, those mutations would have to be passed on without being selected for, and then be able to control the other genes. There's just no known mechanism for that that is naturalistic. And you know what? No known mechanism is also just fine. Maybe they just don't know a mechanism yet, right? So maybe scientists will discover, okay, yeah, we can explain this without anything other than chance. Maybe, I don't think so, but even if so, that's a bacterial flagellum. It just, these arguments just get tougher and tougher and tougher to make, the more complexity you add. Um, and their response right now, by the way, when creationists bring this up is, just because we don't know yet doesn't mean we're not gonna know. Okay, that's a fair response. Tell me when you find out. All right, so the test here not, has to not be what's possible, as both Abuna and um, Kevin have alluded to, but what is probable, all right? So in their book, Speciation, these two awesome evolutionary biologists, Jerry Coyne and Alan Orr, pinpoint the key principle. They say the goal of theory is to determine not just whether a phenomenon is theoretically possible, but whether it is biologically reasonable. That is, whether it occurs with significant frequency under conditions that are likely to occur in nature. A flagellum, theoretically possible? Sure. Biologically reasonable? Not by a, a remote chance. Not even close. Are we saying then that this is impossible? I mean, we can't say that. But under any other, as Kevin alluded to, you know, scientists, scientists look at probability all the time. When a scientist does an experiment, you, you know, give two plants, you know, two different drugs, right? And you say, you know, let's see if the, this drug worked better than this drug, and you collect the data, and what do you do? You do statistics, right? You do statistics to see if there's a significant difference between the two plants or the sets of plants. What does that mean, significant difference, right? You're looking at probability. You're looking at what's the probability that this drug actually did what I think it did versus that the differences I'm seeing are random. And scientists will throw out experiments where the probability is, where it's too improbable that what they think is happening happened. But they won't throw this out. Why? Because of their paradigm. They can't. Because if they throw this out, they have nothing. The eminent geneticist Francois Jacob, I don't know how to speak French, famously wrote that Darwinian evolution is a tinkerer, not an engineer. So tinkering means looking for quick fixes, features that work for the moment, incoherent patchwork change, doctoring machines with chewing gum and duct tape, stopping an invader. So, you know, if you have, if you're a malaria, um, malarial um, organism, a bacterium, and you encounter an insecticide, that's a pesticide that's killing your mosquitoes, um, you can tinker with that. And the, the bacteria that survive, that happen to survive the insecticide, um, will flourish, right? They'll be selected for. So you can, you can do that. 
Lots of other things you can do with random mutation and natural selection, like I said, but you can't make a flagellum. Not even in small steps. That's, that's the argument here. Mutation, random mutation, natural selection requires gradual, small steps, each one incrementally better than the other. How could you have made that machine in order gradually when any one of the parts doesn't do anything, right? So any one of those parts does nothing for the bacterium. How could it have existed without them all existing? So it cannot be expected to produce coherent features where a number of separate parts act together, I forgot that was there, for a clear purpose involving more than several components. Even if someone could envision some long, convoluted, gradual route to such complexity, it is not biologically reasonable to, support, to suppose random mutation traversed that route. And yet again, scientists refuse to let it go. All right, I'm going to move on to my second example of where we're hitting the edge of what evolution can do. We're beyond the, we're beyond the borders here. Um, this is a taxonomy, so this, this system was developed by Carl Linnaeus in the 1700s, I think, um, where to classify organisms, right? So every organism fits under a certain domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, and then finally, family, genus, and species, right? We are, so this is us and an ostrich, we are homo sapiens, that's just our genus and species. We have a whole other set of level, we have other levels of classification, right? So we're, we belong to the kingdom animalia, we belong to the phylum chordata, etc. All right, so that's us. And so this is another classification here of getting us down to the American brown bear, black bear. All right, so the black bear belongs to the domain Eukarya, Animalia, et cetera, et cetera, down to the black bear, all right? The point I want to show you here is that phylum, this third level down, is an extremely high level, right? A lot of animals uh, fit under, there's only a few phyla, you know, tens at most of phyla within the animal kingdom. And this was alluded to earlier by Kevin, something weird happened um, in the fossil record. It was called the Cambrian Explosion, which again, Kevin alluded to earlier, where basically almost all of the phyla in the animal kingdom appeared in like a five to 10 million year period, about 530 million years ago. That is too fast for random mutation and natural selection to occur straight up. For that much diversity to occur in, I know five to 10 million years doesn't sound like a little bit of time, but it is a blip. If you look at, we've time plotted on the x-axis here, um, from present back to 530 million years ago, and then back to basically life on Earth is the end of, is the, is the zero on that axis. The Cambrian explosion was a tiny blip here, and yet, Look at what happened as far as the number of phyla that appeared. So this is basically impossible, right? From a random mutation natural selection point of view, that's not enough time for enough mutations to accumulate and be selected for, for you to get this sort of diversity. In fact, it made the cover of Time Magazine when it was discovered. This is a 1995 Time Magazine cover, and they called it, cleverly, uh, evolution's Big Bang. This is new discoveries show that life as we know it began in an amazing, what? in an amazing biological frenzy that changed the planet almost overnight. All right, so this was kind of stunning to biologists and non-biologists because uh, it was something in the fossil record that really just didn't fit. So just let me back up a sec. So we know that the fossil record. Um, fossils are remains of creatures past, either actual remains or imprints of the creatures, and um, they are found in, in rock, right, so in geological layers of the earth. And for the most part, um, more primitive creatures are found in older layers of rock, which are deeper, and then more advanced creatures, or evolved or complicated, creatures are found 
uh, more and more and more as you go more and more superficial, right? Um, so, and this is really very good evidence for the theory of evolution, right? For the theory of common descent, which is part of the theory of evolution. That we, got, we went from simple to complex in time. No problem, that's all good. This is a problem, all right? This is a thin layer of rock that has a ton of animals suddenly occurring. It has to be gradual or the whole theory just doesn't work unless something else comes in. I'm not saying let's throw away the theory. The theory is great. It explains a lot. But where it doesn't explain, you've got to think there's a different explanation. That's reasonable. That's not what scientists do. Darwin himself said um, of the Cambrian explosion, to the question why we do not find rich fossiliferous, I don't know why he thought that was a word, uh, deposits belonging to these assumed earliest periods prior to the Cambrian system, I can give no satisfactory answer. So basically, um, the ancestors, we, d we don't find a gradual lineage in the fossil record uh, that would lead to this explosion of life in the Cambrian era. And you know, there, is, there still isn't a satisfactory explanation, by the way. Um, there are a lot of papers on this, and I read a bunch of them, and the scientists are saying, well, uh, there was suddenly more oxygen in the air, be, in the water, rather. This occurred in the water. Um, because uh, the plant life, right before this happened, the plant life was increasing, and so maybe it reached some sort of critical level where the plants were making enough oxygen. And then when there was enough oxygen, that was the, you know, the obstacle, the, gate, the gates then opened, and all this mutation occurred. Okay, that sounds wonderful. Um, another theory is, hypothesis is that um, vision developed in these animals. And so as soon as vision developed, predation happened, right? Because before this, when animals couldn't see, they couldn't chase each other and eat each other. It was a simpler time. But, um, but as soon as vision developed, predation became a thing, and then that became a selective force, a strong selective force that then uh, just increase the amount of natural selection that occurred. That's great too. Those both make a lot of sense to me. But this is still not enough time for that to have happened and no one has addressed that. This is a PNAS, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences paper. It's a very prestigious scientific journal. Um, and this is someone writing, assuming the spontaneous mutation rate to be a generous 10 to the ninth base pairs um, per year and also assuming no negative interference by natural selection, it still takes 10 million years to undergo 1% change in DNA-based sequences. It follows that 6 to 10 million years in the evolutionary timescale is but a blink of an eye. The Cambrian explosion denoting the almost simultaneous emergence of nearly all the extant phyla of the kingdom animalia within the time span of 6 to 10 million years can't possibly be explained by mutational divergence of individual gene functions. So his conclusion is that the genes all had to already be there. Yeah, we would say the same thing. All right, so my third example. And this was a question we got earlier. Um, what about human evolution, right? We're okay with other organisms having evolved simpler life forms to more complex. What about us? Are we okay with that? So, this is one model, and this actually does happen, I think. Uh, evolution and devolution. I love that one, too. <laughs> but this one is the one I'm honestly hoping for. Um, so from ape to ape man to man to Superman. I'm really hoping that happens. You know, so, so this is what people think, um, evolutionary biologists think happened. And let me first say, this is not what evolutionary biologists think happened, all right? There's no scientist on the planet who thinks we evolved from apes, okay? That's not the theory. The theory is that both monkeys and humans evolved from a common ancestor, okay? So let's first clear that up. Um, the remains of that common ancestor have yet to be found. Um, but in any case, again, this, you know, in fact, I think a lot of lay people, whether they're Christian or not, or evolution, you know, believe in evolutionism or not, 
um, think that the theory goes that we evolved from apes, and that's just not how the theory goes. So the question for us then as Christians is, are we okay with man having been a lesser creature at some point? Some sort of more primitive, non-ape, but some, some sort of primitive primate? Is that how man came about? I'm gonna present the thesis here that the answer to that is no. Um, I'm gonna posit that God created modern man as he is. Now, there's some evidence of human evolution from an earlier life form, but it's not at all definitive, this evidence. It's based on admitted, admittedly partial and imperfect data, and its details are controversial in the scientific community uh, with DNA evidence not always agreeing with the fossil evidence. So I should tell you, it's not controversial that humans evolved in the scientific community. They all know that's what happened. There's a faith there. But what the, the lineage is, nobody agrees on, because the data are really quite poor, actually, for this. But even if they find out definitively, right, if, if the data, be, you know, or the more evidence is collected and this becomes clear and there's a clear evolutionary tree that can be drawn, DNA evidence, um, I'm going to go ahead and abandon my thesis. And I'm okay with that. It's important to be willing to do that. They won't, but I'm better than them. No, I'm kidding. Um, so if that's the case, right, if, if it can be scientifically um, demonstrated that there is an evolu a human evolutionary tree, then God did it some other way, right? This is what Sayedna was telling. I don't need to know how. I don't care how. I mean, I care because I'm a scientist. But I know that he did. And then it'll just be more complicated than I can understand. No problem. Does Jesus still love me? Yes. Okay, then. I'm set. So, and we may never know, right? And that's okay. So these are, this is a sampling of skulls found that are hominid, that have been classified as hominid. So hominid is a family that goes right above genus and species, right? So hominids include homo, which is our genus, and then other non-human primates are called hominid. Hominid means bipedal. Homo are the only bipedal creatures still in existence, but many have existed before. There is evidence that that's the case, right? They have found these skulls of bipedal creatures that were not homo, some of them. Some of them were homo something, and then of course we are homo. So uh, the um, smeared lines uh, indicate the amount of time that the creature was thought to have inhabited the earth. Um, obviously, the, y, the x axis on top is the passage of time. Um, and then blue here indicates those of the Homo genus. And then there are other genuses, genera, actually, um, represented in the hominid family. The thing is, and th I have no problem with any of this, I can't because there are data. Um, what, are the, what are the connections? So is there a connection between Homo sapien and the others? Can we trace back Homo sapiens tree? And we can't with too much confidence, okay? Look at these lines that are supposed to be the theoretical tracing. This is all theory, right? The, con the skulls are real, but the connections between them are theoretical. Um, but a lot of these lines just kind of peter out, hoping no one will notice maybe. Um, but that's because they don't know what the connections are. Look at this dude. Um, this is the one that's supposed to connect Homo sapiens with earlier creatures, and that's all they have. So that's a pretty impartial skull. Um, and the DNA evidence actually does not support the same lineage here. Here's another possible lineage connecting Homo sapien to earlier hominids. Um, but again, these are inferred relationships without clear fossil evidence. So for now, 
We don't have clear fossil evidence or DNA evidence that suggests that Homo sapiens evolved from earlier hominids. We don't have it. So I like to think that, because this is the simplest explanation given my worldview of Christianity, that God made man this way. Maybe a little hairier or dumber. Um, definitely dumber. But, um, but basically this way. Um, and that, that's when he breathed life into us, and that's when he gave us a spirit. But if they find out that, yeah, there's a lot of evidence and they get more evidence and whatever, okay, then God did it a different way. I have no problem with that. Neither, neither should any of you. Um, there's also archaeological evidence that suggests that Homo sapiens were a unique creature. Um, around 40 to 80,000 years ago, as if out of nowhere, there was an explosion. This one is an archaeological explosion, like the Cambrian, but not. Um, where complex tool use, music, sculpture, and painting all seemed to suddenly emerge. Um, and it wasn't, again, a gradual. Other tools and, and, and archaeological sort of findings, you can see a gradual evolution toward more complex um, tool use. Uh, this was an explosion at around the time that Homo sapiens came into being. It's circumstantial evidence. It's not definitive, but it's something. There's also some DNA evidence. So um, this is a science paper here. Science and nature are like the two top journals in um, the life sciences. Um, not even the life sciences, in science. Um, so they were, they've been able to trace using what's called, um, uh, I think it's molecular anthropology. Uh, they can look at mut DNA mutations in existing peoples and mutations in the, in the fossils that they find, the hominid fossils they find, and they can, uh, based on looking at those mutations, they can sort of trace them back and see which one came from another and create a tree. They've been able to trace, and this is evolutionary biologists have been able to trace um, Homo sapiens to a single female ancestor whom they call um, mitochondrial Eve. In 1987, a Nature paper titled Mitochondrial DNA and Human Evolution Traced DNA to One Woman. That paper was pretty speculative. Um, the data were not great. The population size was small, and the techniques were not great. So many other labs since have repeated the experiment and found the same uh, result to hold. Meanwhile, based on Y chromosome, molecular anthropology. I'm not going to go into why mitochondria lead to a female. Um, mitochondria come from the eggs. OK, I went into it. That was it. Um, and of course, why, why, why chromosomes come from males. So based on Y chromosome molecular anthropology, humanity's male lineage traces back to one location in Africa at approximately the same time as mitochondrial Eve existed. Does that mean? Definitively, God made Adam and Eve in Africa at this time? I mean, that's how I think. That's what I think. But I could be wrong about that. And it doesn't matter. I know he made them. And he breathed life into them and gave them a spirit. That I know. So here we have this evidence. The question is, so what? Can we see evidence of creation? Yeah, we can see some. Um, there could be other explanations for the evidence. Will there ever be incontrovertible proof of creation? No. Why? Because it's a miracle. Not going to be able to prove it. The best evidence is just that the other story, when it stands alone, is really improbable. There's nothing wrong with the theory of evolution. It's awesome. But when it's forced to be the only explanation for everything, then it, it's, that's very problematic. It cannot withstand that rigor. Even if it becomes less improbable someday, OK. It cannot touch belief in creation, because that's a faith thing. So again, don't come to faith because of science. And definitely don't leave faith because of science. It doesn't have the power to do that to you. Let me analogize a little bit. So what about like miracles, right? Um, a lot of people have witnessed impossible things, 
occurring, like an icon dripping with oil. People believe that this is a miracle. People think so. What if, though, there's an icon dripping with oil and you believe it's a miracle and then it's shown that it's either a hoax or there's some naturalistic explanation. The wood is whatever, sap or, I don't know, making it up. But what if that happens? What if it's proven to you that this icon is not actually dripping with oil? Does your faith go away? Is that what your faith was depending on? If so, then you need to talk to an abuna. Your faith should be based on more than that. And it should be based on more than the theory of evolution being disprovable. Miracles shouldn't bring you to faith. That's not why God does them. And lack of miracles shouldn't dissuade you. So let's talk about the sun standing still in Scripture. In Joshua, chapter 10, verse 13, when Joshua and his armies were trying to overtake Jericho, Joshua needed more time, so he prayed and asked God to do this. And so what did God do? So the sun and moon stood still until God brought vengeance against their enemies. The sun stood still in the midst of heaven and did not set in the west until the end of one day. That's what it says in Joshua. This, by the way, was one major reason why, back in the day, the sun had to move around the earth, right? Because how can something stand still if we're the ones moving and it's not, okay? Of course, we know now that that's exactly what happens. The sun doesn't move relative to us. We move around it. In fact, I have a bigger problem with, you know, God brought vengeance upon their enemies, but I'm going to talk to Abuna about that. All right. So, can the sun stand still in the sky? No, that's not what happens. It's not a scientific fact. Wow, that's a small font, sorry. But is it true what was written in Joshua? Yes, it's true. Every person on earth at that moment, on that day, looked up and saw the sun stopped moving in the sky. And that's what Joshua wrote down. Did Joshua write Joshua? I think so. All right. That's what Joshua wrote down. I keep forgetting this is being taped. Um, so, so what was written in the Bible was actually what happened, right? Even today, we know that that's not what happens, right? The sun doesn't move around us, but we still say, oh, look, the sun is setting. It's going. It's going. It's gone. Oh. I'm here for sunrise, the sun is rising in the sky, or I'm going to walk outside, I'm like, ah, oh, the last time I came out here, the sun was there, now it moved to over there. We say that now. We say that all the time. Is it because we're idiots? Don't answer that. But because this, we're, not, we're not making a scientific statement at that moment. I know that I'm the one moving at 1,000 miles per hour, but if, you, if the Holy Spirit who inspired Joshua was like, oh, by the way, what happens is you're moving really fast. I know you can't feel it and it's you who stopped, and then it made it look like the sun stopped. Should Joshua have written that down? Should the Holy Spirit have revealed that much scientific detail to Joshua? What would have happened to Joshua's message? Lost, right? So, um, yeah. So if every word in the Bible needs to be science, then this verse is either, you know, a result of ignorance, or it's a lie, or we can say that Joshua was not inspired by the Holy Spirit when he wrote down his, his testimony, and we don't have to say any of that. Um, as I said, should the Holy Spirit have guided Joshua to say, you know, the earth stopped rotating around its axis, giving the temporary appearance, blah, blah, blah. No. That would have caused um, and, and by the way, Joshua had no idea about this concept of heliocentricity, right? So this would have been just really confusing. Uh, people weren't going to know about that for another couple thousand years. So what would the purpose have been other than to create confusion and result in a loss of the message? But then do we say um, that this passage, which is, by the way, used during a totally accurate description of a historical event, is untrue? No. It's not untrue. It's true, it's just not scientific. 
So why not the same for Genesis? Genesis is also truth, right? That God created everything from nothing, that he made man in his image, and that man fell and required salvation. It's not just truth, um, but it's central to our very faith, this story that's told in Genesis. That's what Sayedna was referring to. So the Bible is so many things. It's history, it's parable, it's poetry, it has it's didactic parts, it's lamentations and praise, it's prophecy, it's revelation, and not remotely all of it is meant to be literal. So why is it so hard for us to accept that? Why do we learn about what scientists have discovered about the natural world and think that it can't be compatible with the essential truth of creation? The word day, as again, again Sayedna alluded to, gets a lot of attention. The timeline, the order of creation, the dinosaurs, things not mentioned. But none of this is an issue unless we require that the Bible be a scientific book, and it isn't. It's, it's a truth, it's a book of truth, and, and this is what we believe, and this is a matter of faith. Um, the truth of the creation and fall and need for salvation are not just, like I said, important, they're critical for our faith. So Genesis doesn't have to even be looked at as metaphor. It just isn't science. All right, so the theory of evolution has many elements that are scientifically sound, and many of them that are less so. Even if those become scientifically sound, there's no threat to the truth of Genesis. Common descent and the DNA evidence thereof are extremely scientifically plausible. The advent of life from non-life, as Abuna and Kevin to told us about, much less plausible. The probability of complexity arising from randomness, as Abuna talked about, is unfathomably low. But it doesn't matter because that we were created is a matter of faith. And nothing contradicts Genesis that we've seen. But God loved us so much that he made us and died for us, that makes no sense, right? But logic, thankfully, isn't the currency we're dealing with here. All right, this is just, I just, I don't know. Nobody, my husband doesn't even think this is funny, but I just love this thing. So this is like a joke mocking creationism. Uh, it says, there are indications that the world is not as old as we are told. For instance, at the bottom of the world, it says, made in China. It is also made from a form of plastic rubber, which was not around until 1943. <laughs> He's holding a globe. <laughs> I just love that. My husband doesn't think it's funny. All right. So this is my concluding pep talk. Don't freak out if you're experiencing doubt. That's a natural process experienced by the holiest of saints. Out of doubt come questions. Out of questions come answers. You should ask your questions, as one has been trying to tell you all, all day and yesterday. You know, blog. I don't know if that's a verb. Um, ask your questions, because we need to have this discussion. The arguments put forth here and at this entire conference do not claim to, to or even attempt to convince unbelieving persons to believe. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, and I will very much leave it to the Holy Spirit. But it's hoped that when certain doubts arise, which they should and they will, some comfort can be had in knowing that these doubts are shared by others, that they're surmountable, and that there are some pretty smart people, other people, not me, who uh, don't see them as problems at all. And take comfort in this. However, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth and he will show you things to come. So you'll find out. Just be patient. And I'll leave you with those funnies. Take questions. Questions? Everyone really awake? Kind of? That's my dad asking a pity question, but I'll take it. Okay. Ezra wrote what I talk about. Man, he copied me. Okay, so obviously I haven't read the book of Ezra. My bad. Okay, cool. Any other questions? <laughs> or yes. So you said the Cambrian explosion happened around like 530, 535 million years ago. Uh -huh. um, so what is the church's stance on how old we think the world is? Like, do we believe that there were, for example, dinosaurs 65 million years ago? Or do we believe like 
man existed at the same time as some of these creatures and then they disappeared or how old mankind is like what is the church's belief on all of that um, I won't pretend to speak for the church but I can say a little bit about this because they didn't know was just here um, I'll tell you this uh, there's no problem with a 65 million uh, year old or a billion you know hundreds of billions of year old earth there's nothing in Genesis that contradicts that there's nothing in the Bible that contradicts that there's no problem with dinosaurs they weren't mentioned but so much else was also not mentioned that's real um, I don't think the fossil evidence uh, suggests that man and dinosaurs lived at the same time. Um, in fact, it does not. Um, so that probably didn't happen. But um, yeah, there's, in any case, no problem with any of that being true. In fact, I think it is until someone shows me otherwise, and then I'll think it's not. I have a quick question. You showed a plot with the spike, yeah. and then it, it goes down, it doesn't go up. Do you know why? Yeah, because a lot of phyla went extinct. Okay. Yeah. Thank do you. you want me to find it? There's a better way to do this. I'm not going to do it that way, though. <laughs> yeah, a lot of phyla uh, that used to exist then don't anymore. Do you know why? Do we know why? The extinctions happen because wouldn't you expect more diversification from um, to occur in general diversification has occurred but not at the phylum level right so the diversification that continues to occur now is at lower levels this is a really high level of taxonomical organization um, so in general new phyla are not appearing um, but um, but yeah uh, new species and probably genera and et cetera, can. Uh, but in general, yeah, the phyla, number of phyla has stabilized. Oh, did it die? Well, then I'm glad I gave you the bad one. <laughs> like species? A similar spike for species um, and the, during the Cambrian explosion. So the question is, if I were plotting species instead of phyla, would I see a similar spike? Um, that's a good question. I don't think there were, there, each phylum didn't have a lot of uh, organisms representing it at the time. So there probably wouldn't have been a great diversification at lower levels. There were many examples of each phylum but not as many as there are now. So no, I would think that that spike would not be replicated if we were uh, plotting lower um, you know, taxonomical levels. But I'm not positive about that, that's my guess. <laughs>